let's do that. Okay. All right, it's about 10.05. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about interactive time series analysis using Druid, Superset, and a little bit of Facebook Profit Library. So let's get started. First, a little bit about me. How did I end up in this situation talking about time series? Um, I'm a data engineer and also a developer advocate at Preset. Uh, Preset is uh, one of the companies that is most strongly supporting Superset and also is in the process of commercializing it into a cloud offering. Um, also, I have scientific experience with time series data and associated methods and mathematical background in uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and statistical mechanics and some other related things. So uh, time series analysis is really close to my, my heart and my areas of interest, and I thought this was a great topic for me to talk about. Uh, it is worth mentioning, though, that forecasting is a little bit new-ish to me. Uh, most of the work that I've done on time series analysis has been more about trying to understand an underlying distribution rather than trying to sort of extrapolate that distribution into the future. But fortunately, profit kind of does that uh, in a pretty straightforward way. So that's that's rad. Uh, the agenda today, we're going to, it seems like we have a lot of beginners here, which is great because we're going to uh, sort of keep things simple. Uh, we're going to do some basic background on what is time series data, what are the technologies that we're going to be using. We're going to talk about some quirks with the Druid setup, Superset setup, and then how to get those two pieces of technology to talk to each other. We're going to go through some simple data ingestion using Druid. Uh, we're going to talk about visualizing time series data in Superset with the uh, couple different charts that we have that are specialized for time series data. And then we're going to also talk about applying predictive analytics to charts using Profit. Uh, again, feel free to ask any questions that you have as they come up. Srini is going to be answering questions in the chat, and also we'll do a little QA at the end. Um, also, keep an eye out for a series of blog posts I'm going to be putting up on the preset blog that are focused on this topic. They're going to go into more detail about all of these things on the agenda, and hopefully at the end, we'll be able to extend what we're talking about a little bit by bringing in uh, one of our excellent engineers by the name of Villa, uh, who will be uh, speaking with me in that blog about uh, some of the things are just around the corner for doing in-chart analytics and superset. So. All right, here we go. Uh, so for those joining who maybe aren't super familiar with Superset, what is it? Uh, it's, an, it's an open source data visualization and business intelligence solution. Um, recently reached the 1.0 milestone. So big congratulations to anybody here who is a Superset contributor and was involved in that effort. It was a huge deal. Um, it works with almost any SQL speaking data source. Uh, it supports query caching, which is great for performance and has a lightweight semantic layer and SQL IDE built in, which is really nice. We're going to see that a little bit later. Also, uh, it's been there's sort of this ongoing move to integrate Apache eCharts, which is another Apache project um, that's focused on producing awesome visualizations into Superset. So we're just bringing more and more eCharts visualiz visualizations in over time. And currently, Superset has a number of time series focused charts. Um, also, Facebook's profit package, for those that don't know, allows some uh, pretty sophisticated time series analysis, but as it is implemented in Superset, gives you some basic options for in-visualization analysis of time series data. Uh, this feature is experimental and is going to receive some more support in the future. Particularly, I was, I was talking with Villa the other day about it, and uh, what we said is that maybe neural profit, which is a, a sort of a new version of profit that uses neural networks to do time series uh, data prediction, we're going to be bringing neural profit into superset very soon, as in like maybe a few weeks, and surfacing more of profits functionality inside of superset. Uh, Druid, on the other hand, is a uh, database technology. Um, it's really cool. Uh, it's, it's a combination of a few different things. It, it has a, a very fast in-memory cache. Um, and also a historical data store that can be configured to run on a variety of uh, a variety of different file systems. Uh, it has a, a cluster architecture, but can also run in a single node configuration and is highly scalable. Um, it has a a segmented, column oriented uh, way of storing data that's that's quite ideal for time series data and supports very very high write volume uh, and very fast reads as well. Um, it's got uh, it's really good for real time and streaming data applications because of these properties. Um, has support for uh, SQL queries. Um, you can schedule all kinds of queries and data transformations, and it's highly performant. Like it's very good at the things that it's good at. Um, also, it has a really cool web GUI for handling ingestion, query scheduling, 
monitoring. I understand that in an enterprise context, a lot of those things are going to be done more programmatically, but it is, I, I do like the web GUI a lot. It's especially nice if you're just kind of getting started with Druid and, and you want to just get going with data fast. Uh, some basic stuff about time series for those that may not know much about time series. A time series is just a sequence of values that are arranged in an order. Usually they're samples from some unknown distribution taken over time, uh, usually at a constant interval. So for example, what is the temperature at noon here in Northern California in the South Bay, right? You could take that uh, measurement of the temperature every day for a year and that would those 365 samples would form a time series. Um, and, and time series, as you might imagine, they sort of appear everywhere in engineering and in the natural world, uh, stock prices, uh, sales of cars on an annual basis, they're, they're just everywhere. Um, and forecasting is often an important goal of analyzing a time series. You want to be able to predict what's going to happen in the near future. Um, there's some great packages out there for doing time series analysis that I want to sort of highlight. Stats models is a really good one in Python that supports a method called ARIMA. I suggest looking into it if you're, if you're curious about it. Uh, DynLM, DynSim, Forecast in R, and Profit is, is another option in Python. Uh, your goal could be to interpolate or to understand uh, a distribution that you have samples from better or to extrapolate into the future and sort of make some predictions. Um, and another thing I want to mention is seasonality is an important concept in time series analysis. So the idea behind seasonality is just that maybe there's things that are affecting the underlying distribution that your samples are coming from that need to be considered in order to make accurate forecasting. So for example, in the real world, seasons on Earth are an important thing for predicting temperature. Um, and any model that doesn't, uh, or any method of analyzing a, a time series of temperatures that doesn't account for the season is going to not probably do a very good job of forecasting into the future. Uh, so profit supports uh, is actually supposed to be particularly good for dealing with seasonality and um, there, those options are available in superset as well so that's pretty cool. All right let's go ahead and dive into the actual technical nitty gritty here. Uh, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is some of the steps that are necessary to set up uh, Druid and get it working properly. So here I'm running an EC2 instance on AWS. Um, I, the instance type is R5 large. I've found that Druid does not work particularly well on smaller instance types, even with the micro quick start configuration, R5 large is kind of like the minimal, uh, the minimal EC2 instance size that I've found to work well. Um, let me pull up my list of uh, setup considerations here. There's a few different quick start options available. So let's explore that. Here we are in my EC2 directory. I've downloaded the Druid uh, package and I've sort of unpacked it. Let's just go in here. There's a binary directory. And what you can see in here is actually that there's a bunch of different start configurations for Druid that are kind of pre-configured. So you've got cluster configurations, single server configurations, and then the quick start configurations, which is what we're going to be working with today just for simplicity. So I'm running the micro quick start, but the nano quick start is an even smaller quick start that requires less system resources in theory. Uh, so that is what we're going to be working with today. Uh, you're going to unpack Druid. One of the uh, prereqs that has to be satisfied for Druid to run on your system is you have to be running Java 8. So make sure that if you are setting this up on a new EC2 instance that you have Java 8 installed. Uh, but beyond that, there aren't really any considerations required. Um, however, in order to get Druid to talk to Superset, you have to configure some kind of authentication for Druid. Uh, so like, uh, th there's quite a few different ways. Druid has some pretty some pretty crazy options for this that I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on today. But I do want to talk about what I view as sort of like the simplest or most basic one that you could do. So we're going to navigate into, um, I believe the directory is the uh, configuration druid uh, single server micro quick start common. Okay, so this is the uh, sort of the common configuration. So Druid is a its structure it has a bunch of different services that all that all run together and common runtime properties sort of stores configuration information that maybe all of those services draw on in some way or another. The first thing you have to do is you have to add this Druid basic security extension to the list of extensions that are being loaded when Druid starts. And if you're already running Druid, you need to restart Druid after you uh, after you add this to the list. Also, if we go down a bit here, 
we have to configure some basic authentication options. Uh, so you have this authentication section. This has to be added to the to the configuration file. Uh, again, don't don't worry if you you know are not able to like write this down or something right now. We're gonna post this recording later, and also the blog post series that I'm gonna do is is essentially gonna go into complete detail on all of these things. You have to configure an escalator. Uh, authorizer, and then also something to make sure of is that uh, Druid SQL enable is true because um, Superset uses uh, SQL queries to access the data that's in Druid. So if this is not enabled, it's not going to work. So this all has to be added. Uh, a couple important things here are when you do this, Druid is going to create a an administrative user, and this is the password that's going to be for that user. So you're going to need that for your connection string and superset. For us, it's password one, but you could configure it to be whatever you want. Also, there's an internal client password. This should probably be configured as well. So th this is kind of the minimal configuration necessary to get Druid to talk to superset. Like I said, there's other ways of doing authentication, but this is just what we're going to go with today. OK, so that's all the considerations necessary in Druid. Um, as for uh, superset, Really, the only thing that you have to do in superset to get the stuff that we're going to do today to work properly is you need to make sure that the FB profit package is installed. So that is going to take the form if we need to go into my superset directory here. So here we are in my superset directory. And if we go into, uh, I should comment, there's a couple different ways of running superset that are sort of, you can go into detail on it in the superset docs on the, on the Apache website or on the preset website. But uh, the simplest way to run superset is to probably use the Docker compose stack. So we, we have a Docker compose stack that has a bunch of Docker images, and it basically starts up everything that you need to run superset. Something to be aware of if it's your first time running superset through Docker is it takes a little while to uh, Docker compose up and get superset running. I'm talking like maybe 30 minutes, maybe 35 minutes. So a lot of people, they'll hit Docker Compose up, they'll let it start, but then they'll kind of like not monitor it and try to immediately go into using superset. And they find that it doesn't work because typically you have to wait. There's like 10,000 node packages that need to be uh, set up to make superset run. So it, it takes a little while. But what you have to add is if you go into the Docker subdirectory, there's this requirements local.txt file. And you need to add FB profit uh, potentially with a version number, if you want to specify a specific version, uh, to basically be set up when you do Docker Compose. And then if you already have a, a uh, superset, uh, if you already have superset running through Docker Compose, you're going to need to Docker Compose down and then uh, Docker Compose up after you add this to requirements local.txt. Something else to be aware of that I found is that you may have to uh, Docker Compose up, let superset start, and then control C to uh, terminate the Docker Compose stack, and then Docker Compose up again, like maybe one or two times in order to get all the dependencies for profit to be installed properly. This has something to do with uh, some of the compiled dependencies that profit has, um, but I, I found a very simple solution is just add it to requirements local.txt, Docker Compose down, Docker Compose up, let superset start fully, uh, cancel or uh, you know terminate superset with control C, uh, Docker compose up again, let it start fully, control C, Docker compose up one more time. And then on the second time, it ends up working with no issues. So that's my like sort of quick hacky guide to getting FB profit working with Docker compose. And I'm going to go into more detail on this in the, in the blog post as well. So anyway, uh, that's everything that we have to do in order to get these guys to talk to each other. So that that is awesome. Uh, so let's talk about Druid real quick. If we go over here, uh, this is the Druid web interface. Um, I'm connected to my EC2 instance, and uh, we have all kinds of interesting options here. So what I want to walk through really quick is just the process of ingestion using the web GUI. You, you see you have all kinds of data sources here, and th these can be expanded through the use of extensions as well. Uh, right now, we're going to be loading the tutorial data that's included with Druid. Um, it's, a, it's a bunch of Wikipedia edits that were taken over a series of hours. So. Uh, we're going to select local disk because we're loading it from our EC2 instance. Um, let's go ahead and, oh yeah. So I've, I've already selected that. And you select what is the base directory that your file is in. And then uh, you can input a file filter here, which selects the files. The reason it's a file filter and not just a single file specifier is because you have the ability to specify multiple files for ingestion at the same time, which is pretty cool. So what we're looking at here is the raw file. It's got uh, it's in JSON format. We've got some raw times. We've got a, a bunch of fields that are relevant to like what the edit is. 
Um, and we move on to parse data. And uh, we're going to confirm the input format, but it looks like Druid detected that it was JSON, so not a lot of issue there. Um, there's some options you can apply here too, but we're just going to skip talking about those for now. Uh, and then you go over to the parse data column, and, and this is a really important step because Druid is going to basically create this, this new time column. It's going to derive it from some column that's in the data that you're ingesting. So in our case, the data has a column called time, and we're taking these times in ISO format, and we are uh, it's basically going to create a new column called double underscore time, which is which it's going to use to organize and segment the data. So it's really important that that this is um, that this is selected correctly. Also, it has some it has some good auto detection. So Druid has automatically detected like what is the most likely column to be storing time and what is the format that it's in. So that's that's very nice. Um, also, you can specify what to do with missing values here as well, which is pretty cool. Um, we can apply transformations to the data. We can generate new columns. Uh, we can filter data out. Uh, we can make custom tweaks to what our schema is going to be. So we have all those options up here. Uh, and then there's some there's some parameters that relate to how the data is actually stored in Druid. So um, you've got how to partition the data, uh, max rows per segment. These are all things that are maybe more relevant to somebody with like uh, who's working on this in like an enterprise capacity. Maybe they have like a data engineering background. Might be interested in some of these things. Um, there's there's some some tuning of the job, uh, the ingestion job, and then ultimately you give your data source a name, uh, and you essentially set the job up and you hit start, and then it, it appears as a scheduled job and runs, and you get you get some confirmation when it's done. So if you want to do this process, you can just go to the Druid documentation, like the ASF Druid docs, and just just follow that, and it's basically exactly what I just showed you. Um, also. You can verify that you have the uh, basic authenticator service running uh, in, uh, oh, actually, I believe it's in, if we go to Druid Home and we go to, uh, I think it is somewhere in here. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but there is, oh, yeah, here we go, status. Uh, you can see that basic security, which we configured in the conf file, is actually uh, running. So that's that's good to double check as well. Okay, so once we've ingested our data, everything is in Druid, and now it's a matter of connecting Superset to Druid. So I'm, I'm running Superset in two places for this demo. One is on my local system through the Docker Compose stack, and the other is in Preset. Um, I'm going to be doing most of what we do in Preset Cloud just for convenience, but you could do all of the exact same steps locally in Docker Compose. Um, so in Superset here, we go data, databases, and we're going to add a new database. And we're going to give it a name like Druid. And then we're going to input a, a connection string. So the connection string for this is going to be this right here. You can see I have the, the IP address of my EC2 system, uh, the port that we're connecting to. Uh, this is necessary. The username, which is by default, I'm using the admin user. So it's admin. And then the password, which we created, which is password one. Um, but if you configure a separate user with the appropriate permissions, you can input the username and password of that user here with no issues. We hit test connection, we get confirmation that the connection is looking good, and we go ahead and save it. So that's all done. Once we add the database, we need to add actually the data set that we ingested as well. So we hit add data set, we select the database, the schema, which is going to be Druid, and then the table, which is Wikipedia data. Um, I've already done this, so I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. You can see that I have my data right here. We can click on it and take a look. Um, yeah, we could we we could view this data in SQL Lab in the SQL Editor if we want to. We can run SQL queries against this against this table and and see all kinds of useful information. But uh, we're not we're not gonna do that right now. Uh, so I'm gonna jump over to Preset Manager now. So we're going over here, going into my workspace. It's the exact same thing. It's uh, it's actually superset. One of the reasons, though, why I preset manager is kind of nice is because all of the bells and whistles that uh, are like kind of the additional functionality that requires some complicated backend configuration for superset are all set up and working without me having to worry about doing it locally. So that's really nice. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna get started by making a new dashboard to hold the charts that we're gonna make. So I'm gonna say new dashboard. We're gonna give it a name. Uh, we're gonna say like Wikipedia. time series data. And uh, we're just going to save this dashboard. Awesome. Okay, so now let's make some charts. 
All right, so we got, we got all kinds of default charts. These are just the, uh, so, yeah, these are just the default ones that are loaded into Superset. So we're going to say new chart. We're going to select our data set, which uh, because we've added it should show up here. There it is, druid.wikipedia. And then we're going to choose a visualization type. There's a lot of different visualizations that Superset supports, and it's kind of an ever-growing list, but there's three of them that are, that are really specialized for time series data. So those are going to be uh, time series bar chart, uh, or excuse me, four of them, time series table, uh, time series percent change, and time series chart. Uh, we're going to get started with time series chart since that's probably the one that's most interesting to everybody because it's, that's where the profit integration is. So we're going to go ahead and say hit time series chart. And we're going to say create new chart. Okay, so here we are. The reason we're not seeing results uh, is because there's a time range specified by default. So this is a time filter uh, that uses essentially your, your uh, time dimension to filter in or out data. Uh, we're going to turn this off. The reason it's not showing up is because it's the data that we've collected from Wikipedia is over a very limited period of time that doesn't fall into the default window. So we're just going to hit that, run query. And you can see that all of our data is compressed into a single day because it is from a single day, which means we need to change the time granularity from day down to something smaller. I'm going to go with five minutes. And ta-da, there's our time series. Uh, so these are basically uh, the number of edits that are happening in five minute windows over the period that we have data for. Um, there's some really cool options here that I want to talk about really briefly. Uh, I, I sort of like these a lot. Um, you have the ability to sort of group this data by different categories that are in the data. For, so for example, if we wanted to know what data is coming from what, like what of these edits are anonymous edits versus which ones are not anonymous edits, we can do this. And it sort of breaks them out. So we have anonymous edits down here at the bottom, uh, non-anonymous edits here at the top. Um, and also, we can apply our, our analytics to these to these groups as well, which we'll, we'll show in a second here. Um, and, and then you have all this stuff that you have in Superset that is available to you. You can, uh, you can save an image of the chart. You can link to it or embed it in a web page. You can uh, save the underlying data to CSV or JSON formats. Uh, you can view what query is actually underlying this chart, and this query is cached by Superset. So uh, if, if you need to access the same query again in a different chart or in the same chart, it's going to happen very fast. Um, and you also have the ability to go over to SQL Lab, which is the SQL IDE, and actually edit and run this query in a bunch of different ways. Um, so that's that all is pretty cool. You have a field here for adding filters to the data. So suppose you wanted to filter out all anonymous, uh, all anonymous contributions. You could do that very easily here. Um, and then down here at the bottom, uh, we have an, you can add an annotation layer. This is a common feature for all charts in Superset. Uh, you can denote particular features of interest. There's all kinds of annotations you can put on top. That's not what this demo is about, but just know it's an option that's available. And if we go down here at the bottom, we have predictive analytics, and this is the part that actually involves using profit. So I'm going to check the enable forecast uh, box, uh, and then you choose the number of forecast periods. So this is how many periods into the future are we going to be forecasting? You select a confidence level, uh, and then you have options for selecting whether or not you know that there's seasonality in this data. In this case, there's no seasonality. It's just Wikipedia data taken over the course of a day. Um, so we're, we're going to say no for seasonality, but you can imagine that if this was instead temperatures, Christmas tree sales over 50 years, something like that, you would see some seasonality in that data and you would want to select yes for, for the appropriate ones of these. So we're going to run the query. And what we see is that we have a sort of uh, a estimation of what the underlying distribution is, but also we have a prediction into the future. And this is our forecasting period. And if we increase our forecasting period, we're going to see that it, it predicts farther into the future where this time series is going. So that right there is the current limit of what is integrated in terms of profit and, uh, and superset. But Really, what's going on here is that we're just making calls to the Profit API. It's very easy to surface more functionality from Profit and then add it to the user interface in Superset. And that's a direction that we're definitely going to be going in in the future. I personally am really excited about the potential of doing more in-chart analytics in Superset. And so that's something to definitely look out for. OK, so we, we've talked a little bit about this chart. Uh, the last thing I want to show here is just that if we go back to our group by and we apply a grouping, we get separate predictions 
for the distributions that are associated with each one of our groups. So that's that's a pretty handy feature as well. I think that's really cool. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and save this chart. Uh, we're going to say um, just give just give it a name, and we're going to save it. And when we save it, we have the option to save it to a dashboard. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm just going to save it to a dashboard here. Okay, cool. So now let's go back to the chart screen and let's look at some of the other chart types that are available for time series data. Um, Wikipedia, and let's look at uh, let's look at time series bar chart. Sort of a similar deal. Uh, you select the time column, the grain, uh, what filter you have for the time period. Uh, you can you can query over a bunch of different a uh, bunch of different metrics. There's different options for aggregation. It doesn't just have to be a raw count uh, of the number of edits. It could be a lot of other different things. Uh, and you can also apply grouping and stuff to these charts as well. So, for example, if I wanted to go back and um, go back and group by whether or not the edit was anonymous, you can get a similar sort of thing right here. So that's that's really awesome. I like this a lot. Go ahead and save that to the same dashboard. It seems like it remembered from last time, which is cool. Go ahead and save that. Uh, just to go really quickly, we're, we're sort of running out of time, but um, I want to talk about the other chart types really quick. So you've got, uh, in addition to, in addition to those two, you also have a time series table, which I have not spent a ton of time looking at, but we're going to look at together right now. I think what it wants us to do here is specify like if you have data that has multiple dimensions of time series, which unfortunately this Wikipedia data does not, you can specify what are the columns that indicate the timestamps and then actually have it break down the uh, break down the data by the different time series that are in your data points. So I, I, that's potentially really interesting if you have time series data that has multiple time dimensions to it. Um, so that's that's something to think about. Unfortunately, I don't have a cool demo queued up for that, so I can't can't show you that. Sorry. Um, and then, lastly, we have time series percent change. Um, so if we pull open this data set for time series percent change, I apply the same settings that we did to the other ones. Turn our granularity down a little bit. Uh, so this basically displays edits as a percent change from period to period. Uh, there's some interesting stuff you can do here. You can apply a sliding window, so you can you can basically have a rolling window where you're averaging every five minutes or every ten minutes or every fifteen minutes. And it's going to smooth the data set out a bit. So if we do that, and I say like twenty periods, let's see what this looks like. It should look a bit smoother. Yeah, we get a lot more smoothness to the data. You can also, of course, apply the same thing with groupings as well. Also, you have options uh, from pandas, pandas resample. What this function does is it lets you basically bin the data, um, which is sometimes useful depending on what your data looks like. So that's that's pretty handy as well. And there's there's quite a few different uh, ways of doing that. So as time goes on, I would expect to see more and more of this functionality surfaced in, in these charts from the underlying libraries that we're, that we're using to do this analysis. And I'm, I'm really excited about the future of Superset in terms of being able to do analytics at the chart level instead of having to do it in other more cumbersome ways. Um, it's gonna really, I feel like, free people who are analyzing data to be creative and to be intuitive about how they're looking at data rather than having to do a lot of uh, planning and pre-processing in order to look at particular, particular slices or angles of their data. Um, so I think that that is about all. We're a little bit over the 30 minutes that I was hoping to go for for the live demo. But uh, like I said, we're going to go into a lot more detail on all this stuff in uh, the blog post series. So keep an eye out for that on the preset blog if you are interested in this topic and you want to follow along. Um, I also encourage anybody who's interested to get involved in Superset. It's an open source project. Um, there's opportunities for everybody to contribute, uh, feature ideas, Superset improvement proposals. If you have a particular specific idea for how to improve Superset, 
You could share your use case in Slack. We're, I think, very curious right now about how people are using Superset so that we can make it better for those use cases. Um, help out new people in the Superset Slack if you're more comfortable with Superset and you know what you're doing. Um, community meetups. And also, we're going to be starting to do uh, Superset office hours pretty soon. So it'll be like sort of an informal opportunity to just drop in and talk to some of the engineers, talk to people who are data analysis experts, uh, talk to dashboarding wizards like Srini, um, and basically get questions answered. Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to show. I just remembered in uh, in uh, Superset. So we're going to do that really quick, uh, which is let's give this a quick name. Say that to our dashboard. And I, I just want to show off really briefly for people that may not know what the dashboarding functionality actually looks like. So if we go over here, we can see this dashboard that we created that was an empty dashboard, but we added some stuff to it. And here's our charts. And you have a lot of options for editing. You have some drag and drop controls. You can create rows, columns, create markdown cells where you can put information for somebody that may not be familiar with your dashboard. Um, so there's, there, there's tons of options here. You can also drag created charts that you've already made straight into your dashboard. Very handy. This stuff is super neat. I'm, I'm really in love with this functionality in Superset. I think it's awesome. Um, and that is about all we got. So time for questions. Yeah, I've been answering some of the questions uh, asynchronously. So if, if folks have questions, we'll be sticking around. Um, as long as you know people have questions, please uh, feel free to use the Q and A tab at the bottom. Um, someone was asking about Druid. I, I uh, sorry, Profit. Um, I think I answered this correctly, but someone asked, "Is Druid necessary to run Profit with Superset? Can I just use no. data from nope. Redshift?" Yeah, uh, Druid is not necessary to run Profit at all. Uh, FB Profit is just a it's a Python package that supports all the the functionality for time series forecasting um and it works with any data set i'm just i'm just using it with druid today because druid is really good for time series data sweet sweet um other questions anything at all oh we got a question uh, mark asked i have data that has one entry per month time series only lets me look at a bar chart and not a line chart does this make sense? It, it, it doesn't. I mean, if you have a time series where you're taking a sample once per month and you have a bunch of a bunch of data points, you should be able to visualize that in other other time series chart types and superset. My guess is like maybe double check that you don't have a filter in place that's that's like messing up your ability to actually see your data and superset. Um, that's that's the first thing that comes to mind, but I, I suppose there's other possibilities as well. I would say uh, if you're having issues with it, take it into the superset Slack and, and we can get your question answered for sure. Awesome. Uh, Shailesh, I'm answering a question with a link uh, with some, uh, I'm sending you a link to a blog post I wrote about um, uh, about basically ways to do funnel charts. Uh, so we answered Mark's question live. Fernando asks, what version superset is this? It is the latest version of Superset, uh, which is 1.0.1, 1.0.1. Um, I think 1.1.0 is just around the corner, so um, keep an eye out for that. But uh, yeah, it's the the version that we have in Preset Cloud is pretty much always the latest version of Superset, which is one of the one of the benefits of using Preset Cloud instead of managing Superset locally. Uh, Jose asks, um, will Druid split? Split JSON data that has a bit complex structure. So it oh, sounds yeah. like a JSON pre-processing question. Yeah, M most definitely. Yeah, you, you have a, a ton of control over over ingesting data in Druid. Um, and actually, like the thing I find most impressive about the Druid GUI is that I feel like they do a great job of making a lot of that functionality available to to you through the GUI. It's not just available programmatically. Um, but yeah, you can split JSON data that has a really complicated structure. You can control the uh, the time granularity of the data at ingestion time. You can control how the data is segmented, um, which has implications for query performance depending on uh, depending on like what your access patterns are for the data. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps out. Yeah, uh, Sudhir asks, how does the time series respond 
if the sampling is set to 60 minutes? Uh, well, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. You mean like the Wikipedia data that we were working with? Um, maybe, Do you want to follow up, Sadir, and, and clarify by what you mean? Um, also, uh, there's another question that just popped up in chat. I want to I want to go at real quick. Sure. Any performance test or comparison between uh, Presto and Druid? Uh, I've personally never done one, but I think that would be a, an interesting topic. I bet you you could find um, maybe biased, maybe unbiased performance comparisons online. Um, not exactly sure. None. I'm, I'm not aware of any off the top of my head that I would that I would reference to you. Um, can you separate data from compute? Uh, can you scale, scale storage and compute? Scale storage and compute, absolutely. Yeah, Druid is really scalable. Um, it's really good in that area. Can you separate uh, the data from compute? I'm not sure exactly what that means. I mean, it depends on how you're doing the computations on the data. If what we're talking about is like computing aggregates or things like that, Druid, you can schedule those to be done in Druid. Um, if you want to take the compute into a totally different environment, I suppose you can probably do that too, just by reading the data that you need into that environment, doing the computations, and then putting it back in Druid, though there may be performance implications with, with doing that. So that's just something to think about. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the separating storage from compute speaks a little bit to the philosophy of Presto and Trino, where you're kind of storing data in a bunch of different places, and then um, the Presto engine is trying to compute it compute what you want as efficiently as possible. So yeah, the, Bupender, uh, Druid and Presto are, are a little hard to compare. Presto is a query engine um, versus Druid as an OLAP real-time interactive analytics data store. So that they're pretty different. It, it's kind of hard to compare, to be honest. Uh, Gaurav asks, can we spot trends in data? Any work going around the same, like simple techniques for adding regression to scatter plot or marking outliers? Basically, you know, what, what, what does Superset have for doing some, some type of basic statistical modeling and outlier detection. Um, I, I, I think we're adding more functionality around that as time goes on. I would just expect to see more and more options for doing you know, things beyond just simple linear regressions. Uh, Srini, actually, that, that's a really good question. I, I've never tried to do a linear regression on a scatter plot in Superset. Does it, does it support that functionality right now, or is that something that we need to add? Oh, uh, yeah, we'll have to add it. I mean, so obviously, so one of the nice things I suppose about about SQL lab in superset and in preset is if you can write a SQL query, you can do quite a bit. So you may have to regress at the SQL layer and just plot that. Um, there isn't anything right now. Profit is the only type of like, um, I would say extra computation or modeling in it, uh, you know, that, that sits above the data uh, or in addition to the data um, right now. So that, um, but hey, if, if you're interested in adding it, like you know, please post in the contributing channel and I'd love to start a conversation about how we can get some of those functionality. And there's possible Profit also has some of these um, built in or some other other libraries as well. And uh, and I think it's worth mentioning also that, that yeah, there, there is some other basic computation available in Superset, like we showed the, like the, the pandas, uh, pandas has like a, a uh, binning, option that can be applied to the data. There's rolling windows, there's stuff like that. So like th there are some other basic like data transformations that can be done in superset at the chart level right now. But I think that that's just an area where we're gonna be growing the functionality. And I think I'm gonna be one of the people that's like pushing to make that happen because I, I think it's like one of the one of the greatest areas of opportunity. Um, and it, it lines up with my own interests as like someone with sort of a vaguely data science background. Yeah. Um, Shalesh asks, any best practices for Druid deployment in production for heavy load? Do you have any context here, Rob? I, unfor unfortunately, I've, I've never uh, deployed Druid into a production environment under heavy load. Most of the experimentation that I've done with Druid has been with the quick start configurations, which are single node, and with some very basic uh, cluster configurations. So unfortunately, I can't give you more context there. I would say maybe um, if you're having questions or, or problems with that, the, uh, the Druid section of the Apache Software Foundation Slack is maybe a good place to pop over and ask questions. Also, uh, I think there's probably other channels for reaching people over at Imply, which is one of the, yeah. it, I mean, Imply is really like the, the company that is, Imply is to Druid what Preset is to Superset. Um, and, and I'm sure that they have a lot more context and information about like running Druid in a production setting over there. 
Great. I'll, I'll answer the, the next Druid. few Q&A, actually. Yeah, um, and then we can go to the Druid uh, question that Bupender has. So anonymous, anonymous attendee asks, for BI newbie who wants to learn Tableau or Power BI, what would be your sales pitch to learn Superset instead? That's a great question. Uh, so in some ways, these tools are similar for many organizations because they are solving that the job to be done is kind of shared collaborative business intelligence, chart, dashboard creation, that type of thing. I would say in practice, they're very different for a few reasons. So one, like Tableau is very much a visualization, a chart creator tool that then evolved to become a dashboard tool and is now trying to be a BI tool. But Tableau is still, I would say the best tool for people who want to create arbitrary a chart. So, you know, something you see in the New York Times that you think is really beautiful and, and amazing and different. Um, if you're willing to spend a few hours, um, you can really make any chart that you can think about. So that's really Tableau's strong suite. Um, Power BI uh, is a little bit closer to, to Superset. I would say it's a more traditional tool. There's, a, there's just a little bit of a SQL editor. You can pick charts and, and build charts without having to code necessarily from, from live data. Um, the sales pitch for Superset I mean, you know, we're biased, but we think Superset is the future. Uh, we think that open source BI, I think it's really only a matter of time before closed source BI is, is really going to be the winning strategy. Um, every other part of the data stack has gone open source and has won. So I'm not, I'm not really convinced that the closed source solution is the way forward. Um, and so I think that's, that's a big thing is, is you're, you know, betting on Superset means you're betting on open source. And we've already seen how popular that is. Um, in, in the rest of the data engineering and, and data science domain. I think that's an important point as well. Um, two, I mean, I'll say to be honest, uh, a lot of these tools like Power BI and Superset are not that different from the end user standpoint. There's a place to run SQL, there's a place to make charts, there's a place to make dashboards. So it's not, it's not from a learning standpoint, it's not so zero sum. You can definitely learn both. Um, I, I don't think um, you need to kind of overcommit to one necessarily. Um, but yeah, so that, you know, hopefully, hopefully that begins to answer the question. The second question, uh, Avinash asks, which superset, in which version of superset is profit available? I believe we've had experimental support since 0 0.38. 0.38 um, is when it was added. Yeah. But, yeah. um, we've, we, we've added a little bit more. I think there's a little bit more functionality in 1.0 and definitely there's going to be more in the future. Cool. Um, I'll answer the next quick question. If I, I wanted to get started with Superset, what is the preferred or best data store to use it with? So uh, if you just pull down the Superset repo from GitHub, and if you use Docker Compose, um, you'll see a Docker Compose file. It ships at the Postgres database. So it's called the examples database in the, post, in the Docker Compose file. So the fastest way, the easiest way to start using Superset with the database is pull down the repo and do Docker dash compose space up. Um, and then you'll see the front end getting built and then eventually be presented with uh, the superset um, homepage at localhost 8088. That is hands down the easiest way to get started. And there's a Postgres database already waiting for you with uh, data and charts and dashboards. Um, do you wanna answer some questions in the uh, chat, Rob? Yeah, I've, I've been kind of looking through questions. Um, one that I see is, uh, does Druid use indices? Uh, do we have to create any index or just parquet vectorized reads? What is data format at disk? So that's that's a few different questions, and I only have the depth of knowledge to sort of answer some of them. Uh, Druid does use indices. It, 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 it indexes on the on the time column, uh, whatever that ends up being. And for whatever your table is, it's going there's going to be like a master time column, which is double under score time, which is derived from one of the time columns that's in your data. Um, so uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by do we have to create any index or just parquet vectorized reads? Maybe I just don't have the background to fully understand that question. Um, and what is the data format at, at disk? I think um, if we're talking about like historical or like persistent data storage that's not in Druid's in-memory cache, uh, the format is going to be whatever. Oh, uh, yeah, I think I understand this question a little bit better. Yeah, I, I think Druid has its own uh, has its own format that's optimized for like the way that it stores data segmented. Um, and it, it sort of stores those uh, in whatever the, the file system that it's configured on 
is it could be it could be like a Hadoop file system or, or something else. You have a lot of options. Um, I, I hope that mostly answers the question. I don't have a lot of like super deep knowledge about Druid that that would maybe make me ideal to give you the right answer there. But I'm I'm doing my best. Mark asks in the Q and A, what why does the Ubuntu install use SQLite? Um, I haven't worked with the Ubuntu install myself, but I do know that. With Apache projects, we do have to be limited sometimes on what libraries we can include. So even the pip install will not come with the Postgres um, database, for example, because that's a separate project. And to keep the pro the core of Superset lean, um, including too many things, you know, is, is definitely the opposite of lean. So one of the ways around that is on the GitHub for Superset, um, we can include more things and, and be a little bit more flexible there. In the official releases, though, we only want to ship the community and the commanders only want to ship the core uh, code base that's actually needed. Um, and that's why in SQLite's easy because it's in Python 3. It, it's not an external dependency. It's built into the language um, since 3.0. So that's by far the easiest way to still ship something. Um, you know, earlier they may have had to ship with no database potentially, which would be a lot more frustrating for first time users. And a quick uh, follow-up is instructions to convert to Postgres. Um, as I mentioned, you can pull down the Docker Compose file uh, from the superset master branch and use that. Um, and if you want to add any other databases, um, I'm going to send you a link right now to the documentation and uh, you, can, you can also do that. You can, you can um, go ahead. There was one other comment that actually that just sort of brought something to mind, which is that um, if you want to set these things up and get them talking to each other and you're doing it on an EC2 instance on AWS, I would recommend the Ubuntu 18 image rather than the Ubuntu 20 image. I had some uh, dependency build issues on Ubuntu 20 that were like not very easy to resolve. So just like a small tip in case you want to try this yourself, I, I would use Ubuntu 18. All right, well, we're almost at the top of the hour. Do we have any last questions coming through or are we, uh, we good to uh, mosey on down the dusty trail as it were? As it were. I think uh, looks like that's it for now. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it was great, great having you. Thanks, thanks Rob for the great live demo. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that uh, everybody enjoyed and found useful. And yeah, feel free to reach out to me via any channel that you can. I put my email address at the beginning. Also, you can find me on the Superset Slack. Um, I'd appreciate any, any comments, suggestions for improvement. Um, I'm, I'm always looking to make these things be better and more useful for the community. So uh, if you have helpful feedback, I, I would be happy to hear it. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it. I hope everybody has a great day and I'll see you next time. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Bye, everybody.